For the past 150 years, people have been looking for better ways to get up and down the Sierra Nevada mountain range. Some ways proved more efficient and less painful than others. And before long, the sport of skiing was born. Hello and welcome to our west. I'm Greg Carson. Skiers are as much a part of our west as cowboys and gold miners. In fact, miners were the first skiers. In the next hour, we're going to meet some of the people who helped create the ski industry we have today. And we're going to witness the evolution of a lifestyle with some of the oldest available film footage of skiing in the Sierra. The Sierra's first skiers were miners who used long wooden skis, then called Norwegian snowshoes, to get around the higher elevation mining camps in the winter. Their style was Nordic or cross country. They had only a leather toe strap anchoring them to the ski, but that didn't stop them from going downhill very fast, sometimes up to 80 miles an hour. They carried a single pole for balance and turning. The miners' competitions became known as longboard races. The first ones were held in 1853, and they were the first downhill ski races in the world. They melted the monotony of winter in the mountains. It's hard to trace the precise start of skiing in the Sierra to any one person, but history gives credit to two men, miners John A. Thompson and Charles Nelson. Thompson is the better known of the pair, earning the nickname Snowshoe from miners in Placerville who first watched him maneuvering through the snow on his two 14-foot planks of oak back in 1853. Snowshoe Thompson became a western folk hero for his legendary mail deliveries over the Sierra in the winter. In 1856, he made his first crossing from Placerville on the west to Genoa on the east. It was a three-day up, uh, two-day back trip. Um, he used sleighs, he used uh, horses on the lower elevations, and then when he got to the top, he actually skied over. And there's all kinds of great histories of him rescuing uh, stranded miners in their cabins, skiing down the mountain with his own son on his back when his son was sick uh, to take him to the doctor, you know, a real folk hero. Bill Clark is director of the Western Ski Sport Museum on Donner Summit. He says Snowshoe Thompson made his 90-mile midwinter crossings for 20 years, earning the reputation as the father of skiing in the Sierra. As Thompson's legend grew, other miners discovered Norwegian snowshoes as a mode of transportation and sport. By the late 1800s, snowshoe races had become a vital part of winter in the Sierra, and not just in the mining camps. A small group of businessmen in Truckee saw another mother load in the mountains, tapping into a vein of rich tourists from San Francisco. In 1895, Truckee held its first winter carnival. This was the winter play area for people in the Bay Area that came up on the excursion trains. Truckee had everything to offer. It had, uh, it had the winter play area. Uh, it had the downtown area, which was full of bars and saloons. And Truckee even had its own red light district on the back street. And gambling, even though it was illegal, it was tolerated. Historian Guy Coates says Truckee's Winter Carnival took an historic step in 1905 when organizers rigged up an old steam engine to pull toboggans up this hill overlooking the Truckee River. It was the first mechanical lift of its kind in the country, and part of the framework still stands today behind America's first ski lodge. Hilltop Lodge was built a few years after the lift went in. In 1913, the Truckee Ski Club was formed, the first formally organized ski team in the Sierra. Ski jumping was the new rage now. The next major advancements in the ski industry would come in 1928 and 29, when scaffold ski jumps were built in Truckee in Tahoe City. Well, it was always a big thing to beat the guys in Tahoe. It was something that uh, you realized the altitude factor that you were at when you're at the top of the, the scaffold as compared with it being on the ground. So in that regard, it was a little scary. The late Earl Edmonds and Frank Titus grew up in Truckee in the 1920s and 30s and were among the original Truckee ski jumpers. That was a goal for every kid to go over that, off of that scaffold. And uh, the jillion steps going up to the top. I don't know how many times I climbed up there, got all ready and then looked down and unbuckle my skis and pack them back down. After you pushed off from the top, the fear went away because you're concentrating on staying in the tracks and 
It, it was quite an experience. Both Frank and Earl were on the first University of Nevada ski team in 1937 and would have been contenders for the U.S. Olympic ski jumping team in 1940 if the games had not been canceled because of World War II. By the late 1920s, skiing had evolved from a method of transportation into the business of playing in the snow. 1928 to me designates the, uh, the beginning of the economic, um, feasible recreation era of, of, of skiing and snow sports. And why? It's because uh, for, coincidentally and for no connection, but just so happened that year the Winter Sports Club was formed in Yosemite. The same year, in, right here in Tahoe City, the Lake Tahoe Ski Club was born with, once again, the intent of bringing people for winter recreation. Um, that was the first year that the Tahoe Tavern stayed open. It was the first time in, ever that a, any type of business in Tahoe City was open in the wintertime. Uh, it was the first time that uh, they allowed the trains to run during that period of time, during the winter months. That was the first year that the Caltrans ever attempted to keep any portion of the old Lincoln 40 Highway open. All these things together, I think was the start of bringing people into the mountains, of really getting the sport going. Robert Froelich is author of Mountain Dreamers, a book that profiles many of the Sierra ski industry's pioneers. One of the people at the top of that list is a man who was born and raised in Reno. Wayne Polson left a unique and lasting legacy in the ski industry. Wayne was the type of guy he always wanted to be. You know, a guy who was very resourceful. Um, uh, so athletic, uh, very dynamic personality, and also a bright guy where he had a lot of vision into uh, uh, what he wanted to do. And what he wanted to do was he wanted to, uh, uh, from the very beginning, uh, make skiing more of a, of a uh, viable uh, financial sport and also get more people involved in it. He had to make his own skis. He had to go down to, had to go down to Steamboat Springs and bend the tips because made them out of, uh, you know, hardwood and then he had to get tip spanned, he had to go into Steamboat Springs and bend them and they made his own bindings and stuff like that. Sandy Polson says her late husband climbed nearly every mountain peak in the Lake Tahoe area during the years he worked as an apprentice for Dr. James Church. Church is the University of Nevada professor who invented the modern method of surveying the snow for moisture content. In the 1920s and 30s, the pair would ski and hike to the top of the highest peaks in the winter, mind you, to determine how much water farmers could expect the next year. Young Wayne Polson carried equipment and supplies through hundreds of miles of the Sierra. He had to ski in from Genoa, Carson Valley, over the top, down into Lake Tahoe. And then the only way to get around Lake Tahoe in those days was by um, the boat. That's how Wayne got to know, not only got to ski before anybody else did, but got to know these mountains and, and uh, which, you know, the ones that would be really be great for development, for ski development. Wayne Polson would discover Squaw Valley on one of those snow survey expeditions, but first he and Sandy would open Nevada's first ski area in 1938. Mount Rose Upski boasted a 560-foot tow rope at the site of today's Sky Tavern ski area. A year earlier, Polson started and coached the first ski team at the University of Nevada, winning the equivalent of the national championship that first season. By the late 1930s, people were downhill skiing at Mount Rose, Badger Pass down in Yosemite National Park, and on Donner Summit at Soda Springs. Just over the ridge from Soda Springs, the first chairlift at a Sierra ski area began running in December of 1939. Sugar Bowl Ski Resort was started by a group of investors that included Walt Disney. Much of the early footage you're watching here was taken at Sugar Bowl in 1940. And it's likely Bill Klein was there that sunny powder day six decades ago. If you learned to ski in the past 50 years, you were probably learning Bill Klein's technique. As the first ski school director at the first ski resort in the Sierra, Sugar Bowl, Klein developed the closed parallel stance off the then popular Arlberg technique. Modifications made by Klein and others created the graceful, effortless alpine style that skiers are still trying to achieve today. Bill Klein was among the nation's premier ski instructors to be called to duty in World War II. The military was creating its first ski patrol, and it would be the single greatest factor in the creation of the ski industry we have today. The 10th Mountain Division goes into action when our West continues.
Welcome back to our West. World War II had a remarkable lasting impact on skiing in the United States. It affected the actual sport in terms of technique, and it affected the people who would return to the states after the war to create the ski industry we have today. The 10th Mountain Division was the U.S. Army's answer to the problem of an enemy entrenched in the rugged mountain wilderness of Italy and other parts of Europe in World War II. Never before had the United States military attempted to put an army on skis, and they weren't taking just anyone for the job. You had to have three letters of recommendation also, attesting to your ability as an outdoorsman, maybe a hunter, fisherman, a woodcutter, or skier. And so most of the people came from New England, the Pacific Northwest, the Rocky Mountains, and the Sierras. And so as a result, you had a lot of uh, top flight people. Chelton Leonard was one of those top flight skiers in the 10th Mountain Division. Leonard learned his skills in the snow of Slide Mountain, growing up in Reno before the days of tow ropes and chairlifts. He climbed the 9,800 foot slope to ski down with people like Wayne Polson and Earl Edmonds. Leonard and other instructors trained 10,000 men who served in the 10th Mountain Division in World War II. When the war was over, several members of the unit decided that to put the horrors of war behind them, they would make skiing their future. After the war, all these fellows had been trained there. They wanted to stay in skiing because uh, of their love of the mountains, the snow, the outdoors, and so forth. So here, all these young bloods took off into various aspects of skiing, whether it be developing ski areas, ski manufacturing, boot manufacturing, lift construction, all these things that go to make up skiing. These people had their appetite whetted, and so when they came back to civilian life, they took off. And many, many of the ski areas and ski industry people have a 10th Mountain Division background. Mm -hmm. It really was the, the genesis of getting the ski industry going. Wayne Polson served as a pilot in the military. His Mount Rose upski operation lasted three years before he left for the Second World War. But he kept his vision for a major ski resort in the Sierra, and he knew where he'd put it, a valley west of Lake Tahoe that he'd found one winter while snow surveying with Dr. James Church. Sandy Polson remembers when her husband first told her of the place during a dance in Sun Valley, Idaho. When we were dancing, he said, you're going to live in Squaw Valley because nobody had ever heard of Squaw Valley. There was nothing here but an old barn, and there was a sheep herders camp on one side, and, and the barn and the stables on the other side. And um, so <laughs> no, I, I said, where's Squaw Valley? Squaw Valley was home to cattle, sheep, and wildlife when Wayne Polson bought it from Southern Pacific Railroad in 1943. He and his family would spend weeks there in the summer, living in tents and hiking the majestic mountains around them. Polson dreamed of a year-round resort at Squaw Valley, starting with a ski area. In need of financing to develop his resort, he met with many potential investors. One of them, a lawyer from New York by the name of Alex Cushing, would join Polson in starting the Squaw Valley Development Corporation in 1948. Irreconcilable differences in business and personal philosophies would destroy the partnership, leaving Cushing with the ski resort and Polson with the valuable valley below. Alex Cushing was another ski refugee from World War II. On Thanksgiving Day 1949, he and Wayne Polson opened the Squaw Valley ski area. There was one chairlift and a small day lodge. Eleven years later, it would be the site of the eighth Winter Olympics. Did you have a vision or did you just say, this is a really nice place and I, I want to get a hold of it? <laughs> I, I think that uh, I didn't really have a vision. Um, Going back to work in New York in a Wall Street law firm, which is what I was doing, after five years away in the war, it wasn't very appealing going back there. So uh, I came here in a way to avoid going back to New York. As World War II veterans began building the business of skiing, more people began taking up the sport. In 1955, another of the Sierra's major modern resorts opened when the chairlifts at Heavenly Valley started on Lake Tahoe's South Shore. Once again, it was a man's love of skiing that inspired the lifestyle. Chris Carizes, who began Heavenly 
He uh, ran away from home when he was 15 and upped in the Army Corps and, and uh, from there uh, ended up becoming a multi-millionaire down the road. When he came to uh, South Lake in 1953 with his wife, they purchased for I think under five grand what was then called the Bijou Ski Run. It was just a couple of rope toes. He named it Heavenly Valley to sort of attract people uh, uh, to the place because of its really beautiful uh, moderate slopes and majestic views. Today, Heavenly Ski Area covers more than 3,000 acres in two states, the biggest ski resort in the Sierra. A handful of other Tahoe ski areas were also started in the decade after World War II. Sierra Ski Ranch, today called Sierra at Tahoe, opened in 1946. Mammoth Mountain started operation in 1951, and Donner Ski Ranch opened in the mid-50s. The 1950s were just the beginning for the ski industry. By the end of the decade, ski makers were perfecting metal edges and lock-in bindings. Chairlifts were becoming more efficient and more common, making the sport more attractive to more people. Skiing was also becoming specialized. You could downhill, cross country, or telemark. There were a half dozen ski areas in the Sierra by the end of the 1950s. The next big growth spurt for the industry would come at the start of the next decade, and it would make the Tahoe area the center of the skiing universe. The Olympics come to Squaw Valley when our West continues. Welcome back to our West. I'm Greg Carson. The story of how the eighth Winter Olympics ended up here at Squaw Valley is truly one of the great sports tales of all time. It begins, as many legends do, with an impossible dream. It started off uh, really not very, very seriously. It was a way of getting some, some, uh, some press. Reno would have fought for the Olympic Games. Winter it was 60 Olympics, and uh, so I said, why don't we apply, you know, not, not thinking much about it. I started getting mail from people saying, this is a wonderful thing that you're doing, applying for the Olympic Games. Well, I really wasn't doing anything. And I thought to myself, uh, supposing I was really doing what these people think I'm doing, how would you do it? Alex Cushing usually gets the credit for bringing the Olympics to Squaw Valley. There were others, Joe Marillac and Bill Berry to name two, but it was Cushing who sold the idea to the U.S. and international Olympic committees. The odyssey began in 1954 when Cushing read that Reno had applied for the 1960 Winter Games. Using his skills as a lawyer, he got the California legislature to appropriate the money he needed to make a bid to the U.S. Olympic Committee. He shocked everyone, including himself, by winning the bid over the likes of Sun Valley, Lake Placid, and Reno. Using his skills next as a salesman, Cushing took his case to the IOC. Innsbruck, Austria was the odds-on favorite to get the eighth Winter Games. Critics thought it was preposterous that Cushing had the audacity to apply for the Olympics when all Squaw Valley could offer was one chairlift, two rope toes, and a small ski lodge. He can still hear their comments. But there was no such place as Squaw Valley, and I wasn't the mayor. That was, that was the, uh, they said it's just a promoter's dream, Squaw Valley. There's nothing there. Nothing but world-class mountains and the vision of a single self-contained Olympic village just steps away from the events. You know, when there's nothing there, you can conjure up all kinds of images and stuff like that. There's, no, there's nothing there. We, we said there's, it's a return to simplicity and whatnot. We're going to have all the athletes under one roof, whereas in Europe they'd been in separate hotels and so forth. Here was the common life under the common roof. Cushing also used tradition against his European competitors. We said the Olympics belonged to the world. And we said for the past six or seven Olympics, it's always been in the same mountain. It was in different countries, but we said, we said it's the same mountain. We, you've got to branch out. The International Olympic Committee agreed, moving the Olympics from the Alps of Europe to the Sierra Nevada of the U.S. The guy said, 
who decided to give it to you guys. I, mean, I just, I almost fainted. The Winter Olympics almost came to Lake Tahoe in 1932, but went to Lake Placid that year instead. The Olympic trials were held that year at Grand Lebakken. But in 1960, it was the big show. With help from the state and federal governments, Squaw Valley was transformed from a nearly empty 600-acre valley into an Olympic host site. The concept of having athletes and events in the same place worked. I can't recall exactly who it was. It seems like it was one of the Austrians or Germans came up to me and said to me, we didn't think you could do it. And uh, it was the mo one of the most successful Olympics ever because we had everybody there. The exchange of ideas and friendships from athlete to athlete, which is what the Olympics is all about, really. By the mid-50s, Chelton Leonard had returned from World War II and taken over as coach of the University of Nevada ski team. He was named assistant sports technical director for the Squaw Valley Olympics. He remembers watching a cross-country race in which a Japanese skier with a broken ski in his backpack went by and was followed later by a Russian judge on one ski. The Japanese skier had broken a ski almost in front of one of the Russian coaches. The Russian coach gave one of his skiers to the Japanese skier to complete the course. Now that, to me, is an example of what the Olympics should be. I want to beat you. I want to try to beat you, but I want to do it fairly and squarely. The eighth Winter Olympics included 700 athletes competing in 27 events. Women's speed skating and the biathlon were new to the games in 1960. The Japanese ski jumping team competed for the first time. After a week of storms leading up to the games, the weather cleared and was perfect for all eight days, and an estimated 240,000 people attended. A $7.50 ticket got you into at least five major events. The U.S. team won three gold, four silver, and two bronze medals, including the first gold in ice hockey. The Squaw Valley Games were also the first Olympics to be televised daily. Walter Cronkite hosted the coverage on CBS. The footage you're watching here was taken by another Sierra ski pioneer, Carson White. There had never been another Olympics that was as good as that. Why do you say that? Well, everything was concentrated in one area. The only things that were away from the alpine events and the ice skating and all was the um, cross country in biathlon. And that was held over in McKinney Creek, which is over by Lake Tahoe. The games themselves are considered a success by all standards, but it was what happened after the Squaw Valley Olympics that had the biggest impact on the ski industry. Within one year, you saw Alieska go in, you saw Vail go in, you saw Alpine Meadows go in, you saw um, uh, skiing be looked at as not just an athletic fringe sport, but something very romantic something very fun because of the, the European flair to it, I think. Um, and, and what it did here was it opened the doors up to uh, the Sierra Nevada, certainly, and to the whole West Coast ski industry. Several ski areas opened in the Tahoe area in the years right after the Winter Olympics. And as they did, something was happening. The Sierra was becoming home to a new way of life, snow farming, when our West continues. The international attention on Squaw Valley during the 1960 Winter Olympics inspired others to look at the Lake Tahoe area with an eye for skiing and winter sports. And they found world-class mountains from Alpine Meadows to Kirkwood. And for most of those early snow farmers, running a ski resort was just a means to an end, a way to live in the mountains and ski every day in the winter. I left Sacramento and, and decided that I'd move to the mountains and, and be a ski bum, so to speak, and all of a sudden uh, I was looking at it more of, of that, wait a minute, this could be a, a good way of life. Norm Saylor owns and operates Donner Ski Ranch, located across the road from Sugar Bowl on what used to be the only highway over the Donner Summit. Donner Ski Ranch opened in the mid-50s, before the Olympics, and certainly had the potential to be a major resort but it has remained one of the Sierra's smallest. In fact, Sailor himself still plows the parking lot every morning. 
it's a personal thing with me. Uh, I still believe that there's room for people like ourselves. Maybe, maybe we don't have the the McDonald's image or the the you know the big ski area image. We have a lot of great skiing. I don't think we're recognized for as much skiing as we have. We do have six chairlifts, and we offer a bigger variety than a couple of the resorts that I compete with. But but we don't have enough plastic. Sailor's personality is certainly part of what makes Donner Ski Ranch successful despite being small. He was one of the first resort operators in the country to sell a lift ticket to snowboarders and telemark skiers. Sailor was also the first to allow and encourage disabled skiers on the slopes. The 1960s saw the Tahoe area grow into the largest concentration of ski resorts in the world. Eight new ski areas opened that decade. Just down the ridge from Squaw Valley, Alpine Meadows opened in 1961. The resort was built in six months and opened December 28th of that year. In 1967, North Star at Tahoe opened one row of mountains to the east. The same man designed both Alpine and North Star. Peter Clausen was a key developer of today's Sierra ski areas. Kirkwood opened in 1972. Access was the major problem there. Highway 88 wasn't plowed in the winter. Founder Bud Klein was able to convince Caltrans to keep 88 clear from South Lake Tahoe to Kirkwood with a $700,000 cash bond and a promise to build two maintenance stations for the plows. The Sierra's youngest ski area opened in 72 with four chairlifts in a 15,000 square foot lodge. Homewood Mountain Resort is another Tahoe ski area with an interesting past. It began as a private tow rope operation in 1958 by West Shore landowner Don Huff. During the 1960 Olympics, he allowed a few non-family skiers to use the lift. The next year, Homewood's ski area opened for business. Just over the ridge to the south, Tahoe Ski Bowl opened in the late 60s. Folklore has it that the family in possession of Homewood ski area one of the founding members was drafted. While they were gone, the landowner at Tahoe Ski Bowl took the rope tow down the street, operated there while they were gone. When they returned, they had this friendly and sometimes not so friendly rivalry. But Homewood would have the last laugh. The rivalry ended in the mid-80s when Homewood bought out Tahoe Ski Bowl and absorbed the acreage. Since they aren't the biggest or the steepest, smaller Sierra ski resorts use other ways to attract business. For instance, Homewood and Diamond Peak offer incredible views of the lake. Sometimes it feels like you might ski right off the mountain and into the water. Other places like Mount Rose, Tahoe Donner, Boreal, and Donner Ski Ranch all keep ticket prices below the big resorts to lure more families to their mountain. Diamond Peak has a unique past. It's the only major ski area in the Sierra that's owned by the people of the town where it's located. Started in 1966 as Ski Incline, it had the first comprehensive snowmaking system in the Lake Tahoe Basin. Renowned ski area developer Lugi Foger designed Ski Incline. In 1985, the name was changed to Diamond Peak. We're owned by the residents of Incline Village, so one of our goals is to service the residents of Incline Village with the best possible skiing and family programs that we can at the mountain here. So that's a priority to us. The Tahoe Truckee area is also home to some of the most popular backcountry skiing and snowboarding in the world. Even with a dozen ski resorts in a 20 mile radius of the lake, there is still a vast expanse of wilderness, accessible only by foot or helicopter. The backcountry beckons the spirit of the Sierra's first skiers. The backcountry and the smaller ski areas give Lake Tahoe a reputation as a place where every skier and snowboarder can find a home. One resort in particular has become the hometown hill for generations of people living in Nevada's high desert. Mount Rose blooms when our west continues. Welcome back to our west. We're on some of America's oldest ski country now. People have been climbing up and skiing down Mount Rose and Slide Mountain since the early 1930s. This area, Sky Tavern, was known as Grass Lake back then, and this was as far as the snow plows went. From here, you had to go it on foot through the snow up to nearly 9,800 feet.
It was pretty rugged. It was before the chairlifts were invented. Put a seal skins on, get it climbed to the top. One run down the powder. <laughs> Depending on how far we would ski down the face of Slide Mountain, which was the east side, we would ski down that and then come back and take 45 minutes to an hour. To climb back up, we'd get one or two rides back down and then ski back out to Sky Tavern. And a lot of times then we'd continue skiing on down to Galena Creek. Shelton Leonard and Doc Watson were both among the first Slide Mountain skiers. Now just to avoid any confusion here, that Slide Mountain there on the left. Mount Rose is the taller peak to the right, but the Mount Rose ski area is located on Slide Mountain. Okay, now in 1938, Wayne Polson took a little of the work out of skiing here when he started a tow rope operation called Mount Rose Upski. It was Nevada's first ski area, and it soon became home to a generation of skiers. Polson would move on to Squaw Valley, but shortly after World War II, others took up where he left off on slide. A lodge was built at Sky Tavern. By the mid-50s, the ski operators had moved up the mountain. Reno Ski Bowl was on the east slope of slide. A lodge was built, and at one time, a mile-long chairlift connected it with Sky Tavern. You can still see the metal supports of the old ringer chair along the Mount Rose Highway. The chutes, those steep natural ski runs separating the east and north slopes of Slide Mountain, were open to skiers until the mid-1960s. In fact, a shuttle bus would take skiers from the bottom back to the ski bowl chairlift. The chutes were closed to the public in 1965. That same year, Reno Ski Bowl was renamed the Slide Mountain Ski Area, and on the north slope, Mount Rose Ski Resort opened for business. The two ski areas competed for the next two decades, the rivalry ending in 1987 when the Slide Resort was bought out by Mount Rose. Slide Mountain has a rich racing history. It was the site of the nation's first college ski championships. The NCAA races were held here in 1954. That year, the world's first giant slalom race was also run on slide. The mountain was an alternate site for skiing events in the 1960 Winter Olympics. The Mount Rose Ski Area is also home to one of the Sierra's oldest and most successful youth ski teams, the Falcons. And the man who started the team was one of those early slide skiers. When I came out here, there weren't very many kids that skied, you know. Uh, there was Alan Ramsey and Pat Myers and some of those kids that skied, but not very many of them. And so uh, it, uh, I, I would go up with Wilbur May and, and uh, Frank Bender and people like that, uh, adults that would take me up. And that's how I got started. Rusty Crook was younger than most of the skiers who climbed Slide Mountain to get that three-mile run through the powder. He learned well enough to get a skiing scholarship to college. He started coaching the Falcons in 1958, and his list of former students includes Olympic team members and ski resort operators. Today, Mount Rose Ski Tahoe still boasts the area's highest base elevation at 8,260 feet. It was among the first resorts to allow snowboarders. In fact, the first quarter pipe in the country was here. Today, it continues to be a favorite for Reno residents who have to drive less than 30 minutes for world-class skiing and snowboarding. We've been talking about the lifestyle that's evolved with the growth of the ski industry. Now, we may be quick to call them ski bums, but for the first Sierra ski farmers, a lot of hard work went into creating the industry we have today. The old timers are back with more of their stories for us when our West continues. Why do I ski? I love it. Oh, well, you got to do something. You can't stay at home and sit. I'm 70, and I love it. The first generation of modern downhill skiers is almost gone. People like Wayne Polson, Bill Berry, and Chris Carriza have already left us. But there are still some pioneers left to tell us what it was like in those days before bindings and metal edges, before chairlifts and plowed roads. It was a method of transportation. I used to ski to school, as an example, from High Street over to the high school. And then it was uh, up on the hill, so we naturally started to ski down the hill. And this is how I happened to get uh, started skiing. Going to high school, we'd all ski up there. And uh, we'd ski up different uh, ways. We wouldn't make a trail, and the teachers couldn't get to school. 
so we'd have a day off. Because <laughs> <laughs> they relied on you guys to make the Yeah, we'd, we wouldn't make the trail. There was no way they could get to, to the school. But uh, skiing was just a way of life. Frank Titus and the late Earl Edmonds remember when skiing was a requirement to live in the Sierra during the winter. Growing up in Truckee in the 1920s and 30s, they were among the original ski jumpers in the Lake Tahoe area. Over in Reno, Carl Doc Watson remembers how he and his friends caught ski fever. There was a movie entitled Slalom, showed at a local theater. And we all went to see it just before Christmas, 1937. A whole bunch of us uh, got interested and started at Christmas Day that day. <laughs> I began with a pair of skis like those without bindings, all they had was a strap over the toe, and uh, just puddled along, you know, and I had boots that came up to here, they were hiking boots, they weren't even ski boots in those days. So we were talking about 1936 or 37. A love of skiing brought Carson White and his wife Vi to Donner Lake from the Bay Area in the 1930s. They met during a ski outing at Cisco Grove. Carson has been a part of the ski industry from the start, helping found the National Ski Writers Association and serving as head of public relations for Alpine Meadows. He and Vi were friends of Wayne and Sandy Polson and skied with them at Squaw Valley before there was a chairlift. Here they are skiing behind a snowcat called the Weasel. That's Carson in the shorts waving. Vi is right in front of him in the hat. The Whites would probably still be skiing the Sierra today if a respiratory illness had not forced Carson off the mountain several years ago. Do you miss it? Oh, it just cut my heart out. <laughs> I just lived for skiing. I loved it. What is it about it? Can you, can you explain, can you put in words what it is? I don't know. It's the exhilaration of having the power to control your movements all by yourself. No mechanical help or assistance. You are the master of those skis when you're coming down the hill. And I was so happy when I discovered the West. Uh, was I, I hated skiing back east of solid ice. You can see the flowers growing through the ice. Sandy Polson was a college student back east when she first heard about skiing in the West. As luck would have it, a classmate from Idaho invited her to one of the nation's first ski resorts in 1935. And she kept saying, you have to go out to the new place my dad just started, my uncle, and it's uh, called Sun Valley, and it's in Idaho, so you've got to go try that. And so I went out there, and you know, I never really, never really went back east because I just love the, I love the West. The Tahoe area is home of the original ski bum. The necessity of skiing back in the early days and the development of the modern ski industry were the perfect conditions to create the culture. It's also created a bit of nostalgia among those first Sierra snow farmers. As so many people are coming to the mountains today, they say they're going skiing and snowboarding when a lot of their time is spent shopping, uh, hot tubbing, and a lot of these things. They're not the avid person that we had years and years ago. We had that when the snowboarder came along. Oh, he was just like we were when we were kids. All we wanted to do was just do it. The lure of the snow and mountains is more powerful than money to some people. The Sierra ski pioneers were the first to turn that passion into a profession. All these individuals um, probably could have been very successful in anything they did, uh, yet they chose one of the goofiest industries in the world, the snow, being a snow farmer in the, in the ski industry. When our West returns, people start riding down the mountain on one board instead of two, and the Sierra ski industry gets ready for the start of a new century. Snowboarding hit the ski industry like an avalanche in the mid-1990s, but boarders have been surfing on snow for more than 30 years, 
And just as skiing has its roots in the Sierra, so does snowboarding. If, if this isn't the original snowboard, it's certainly one of the originals, the snurfer. But before there was snowboarding, there was snurfing. You can see where this idea came from. Surfers decided to trade waves for snow and thought it might be a good idea to hang on to something, in this case a rope. Western Ski Sport Museum director Bill Clark remembers when he first saw a snurfer. First time I remember snowboarding is working in the ski industry at a, at a trade show at Mammoth, uh, demoing skis. And a guy up on the hill, we all kind of looked up, and the guy had this contraption that he stood on, and he had the rope. Uh, I think it was probably a snurfer um, skiing down through the powder, and that's the first time I ever encountered it. Tom Sims is arguably the first person to ride a snowboard back in 1963, although Jake Burton would have something to say about that. You might recognize both names from their snowboard companies, two of the world's biggest. Sims in particular tested his boards in the Lake Tahoe area, and his top hands-on researcher was a kid who grew up skateboarding in the Bay Area. Moved up here in about 77 and pretty much started snowboarding right about then. We were just using bungee straps to keep our feet in, so when you really took a good fall, you pretty much just blew out of your board. I was one of the first ones to progress skateboard-style tricks into snowboarding. I'm not saying I was the first, but first one to get recognized for it anyways. Terry Kidwell is known as the father of freestyle snowboarding, winning three world championships. Freestyle is all those flips and tricks you see boarders doing in the half pipe, that trench in the snow that gives them something to jump off. You're watching some of the first snowboard film ever taken. That's Terry and his friends who were called the Tahoe Underground, and they broke the trail for snowboarding. Kidwell is also one of the first people to make a living riding a snowboard. In 1985, he signed a contract with Sims Snowboards, the first rider to have a pro model. Today, Kidwell has his own snowboard company. But before all the fame, there were the early days. Mount Rose was popular. No, they all went up there because no one would sell them a lift ticket. Oh gosh, it was super tough and I, I believe Boreal and like Donner Ski Ranch were a couple of the first. I, I remember going to Boreal as my first place to not have to hike, get a chairlift ride up and get to cruise down without all the, the struggle of hiking up the hill. Snowboarding came along and I just looked at it, hey, it's just another person that wants to ride the chairlift. And they came along and, and we were big. We were big in snowboarding. We've done some things. The other night I was watching television and here was a guy doing a triple twisting quad jump and they're saying it's the first time ever. Well, we did that way back with a guy, Dick Barrymore, a filmer, and we did that back, I think it's almost 20 years ago that we did that, and they're saying it was the first time ever. Norm Saylor saw snowboarders for what they were, the future of the ski industry. But most resort operators didn't share his foresight back in the early and mid 80s, so most of the first snowboarders ended up hiking and climbing for their rides, much like the first Sierra skiers 50 years before. In 1983, the world's first snowboarding championships were held at Soda Springs, featuring the first ever halfpipe competition. Once I got hooked on it and had some of my first runs where I was like, wow, this is really cool, that I thought it would take off and blow up. And that was, you know, like 13, 14 years ago. And to me, maybe, it actually took longer than I thought. The future of skiing in the Sierra seems as bright as the 300 days of sun that shine on it every year. Tens of millions of dollars in improvements and expansions are planned at various resorts. Perhaps the most notable project, the tram that will run from the South Lake Tahoe Casino Corps straight up to Mid-Mountain at Heavenly. You have uh, so many different cross-country areas, backcountry areas, alpine areas. I think the competition of the ski industry here in the Tahoe Basin uh, is, is the cruise ships, Club Med, Hawaii, um, maybe the, the Colorado Rockies, things of that nature. Um, and I still think that the Tahoe area and the ski industry is pretty much untapped. I think there's a, there's a, a big future if it's done correctly and with some cooperation. One of the most exciting possibilities for the Sierra ski industry is the potential of bringing the Olympics back to Lake Tahoe. It seems fitting that the main selling point for that, so many ski resorts so close together, is the direct result of the 1960 Winter Games at Squaw Valley. The Sierra Snow Farmers, more than ever, a vital part of our West. Until next time, I'm Greg Carson.